Let's hear Philippians chapter 2. So we're going to read the first eight verses of Philippians chapter 2 together. You notice in verse 1, the Apostle Paul says to the church of Philippi, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, any bowels of mercy, once again, verse 2, fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man of his own things, but every man also of the things of others. Verse 5, verses 5 through 8 is a uh, key verses here to the book of Philippians. But you notice in verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Verse 7, but made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form, but took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Verse 8, being found in the fashion of a man, what did he do? He humbled himself. Then became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. These verses aren't on the screen, but I just got to keep reading. Notice the verse, verse 9. Wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name, which is above every name. That in the name of Jesus, every day shall bow. Of things of heaven and things of earth and the things of the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ was Lord. Is that what it says? Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray together. Lord, we come before you today. Lord, thank you for the unity that only you can produce. Lord, I pray today that as your children, Lord, that we will be pliable. Lord, it's so easy to become stuck, to become fragmented, to become callous. But God, I pray that we will become pliable vessels, Lord, to be used for you, for your glory, for your honor. Lord, if there's a lack of unity anywhere, anywhere amongst uh, this church family today, God, I pray you'll work, you'll convict. God, it's just my heart, I pray that you'll show me. Lord, because we know that that is your heart for your children, Lord, that we will accomplish your word. Your work, your way, Lord, that is the way of unity. Lord, we praise you, we thank you. We ask all this in Jesus, precious and holy name. Amen. You can find in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 18, the Apostle Paul said, For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you. And Paul said, Now partly believe it. You can find in the church of Corinth the issue of division. You find in the book of Philippians, the issue of division, all throughout the New Testament, we see these illustrations of how detrimental division is to the local church. But time and time again, we find this principle of unity, biblical unity, unity that only God can produce through his son, Jesus Christ. You know, you may be here today, you might look throughout this room, you may say, you know what, there's no way I could ever like it. Can I encourage you to this? God is all you to look. There may be a strained relationships. There may be a people that don't talk. There may be people that if you see someone coming, you turn and you go the other way. How can we believe this? Because we're all human. How many of you are like me? You're human. There's been times in my life where you know there's people I didn't like. Even recently, I ran into someone and from a distance. You know what I did? I turned and I went the other way because I did not even want to have a conversation. With how many of you know that feeling? You know, you, you think about the love that God has called us to have for fellow believers. It's not always easy, but it's only possible through Jesus. And that's one of the greatest principles of unity for the local church. And this is the first principle you can write down this morning. We must have Christ-like love. That's not Philip love. That's not Stephanie love. That's not Dustin love. That's not even Colby Woodward love. That's Jesus love. Why? Because you think about that. I don't have enough love within me. Colby Woodward doesn't have enough love within him. This is only possible through God accomplishing his work in us and through us. You see in verse 2, Paul said this, fulfill me my joy. See, Paul had a joy within him that we need. Paul has seen God bring him through so much. God has seen, Paul has seen God work in so much. And God had placed within the apostle Paul a joy. And he said to the church of Philippi, hey, I want you to 
you to have my joy. And here's how you can do it. The G be like minded. You know, I've heard it said, we don't all have to be on the same chapter, in the same chapter, on the same page, but we must all be in the same book. We must be like-minded. We must be going in the same direction. Notice in verse 2, that you be like-minded, having the same, what's that next word? Love. Being of one accord and of one mind. You know, if, if I actually cannot think of a better illustration than this piano over to my right. Uh, how many of you know how to play the piano? How many of you are like me, you wish you knew how to play the piano? Uh, in middle school, I was in the band for a little while. It, it didn't go well. Uh, musical talent is not a trait that I inherited. But man, there's nothing more beautiful than a piano that is played by someone who knows how to play the piano. How many of you have ever heard of someone that thinks they know how to play, play the piano, but they can't? Just a couple of weeks ago, we were over at Augusta, and as you're walking down the street in downtown Augusta, you, there might be different instruments played. There was someone that was playing an instrument, and I don't want to say what instrument, because you may have seen this person in downtown Augusta before, but I thought to myself, this person was playing uh, with the hopes of someone giving them money. And I remember thinking to myself, you guys forgive me, I thought to myself, and if you want more money, you might want to pick up a different instrument, because that wasn't working out for you. It wasn't. The notes weren't going together. There was, it was not cohesive. There was not, uh, as we find here, there was not one accord. There was not a oneness. But you think about a piano. You can hit two notes that just don't go together, right? Had there were two notes that just don't go together. C and D, just don't go together. Uh, I'm going to trust you on that because I don't, I don't know. I'm not an expert in that area. But if you have someone behind that instrument knows what they're doing, then they can make all these notes just beautifully flow together. There's notes on that piano that are drastically different. But when someone that knows what they're doing puts their hands to that piano, they're able to use each note to accomplish that note's purpose. Let's think about this as a local church. How many keys on a piano? 126. Is that right? Am I wrong? How many keys are on the piano? 88. See, I'll just not even close. <laughs> tell it, tell me, guys. Music is not my thing. So, 88. Here in this auditorium today, we have many more than 88 people. But what we can't agree on is I don't know exactly how many people is it true, but there's a lot of different notes. How many of you are sitting next to someone that's a different note than you are? Like, there's no way that these two individuals can go together. I'm not going to ask if any of you were married to that person. But uh, a lot of variety, right? But here's the beauty. God, as he puts his hands to the instrument that he calls his church, he has this divine ability to use each note, to use each person to accomplish his will. So you know what it produces? It, it produces a beautiful song, which is God's work being accomplished. One of the greatest principles of unity is Christ-like love. We see this again in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. When Paul, he's talking to this church in Colossae, he says, Put on therefore the elect of God, holy beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. And above all of these things, put on charity, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, the bond of perfect purpose, of perfectness, as Colossians 3.14 illustrates. Literally what we find there is the love is the actual glue of unity. Again in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, Peter says, finally, be of one, be all of one mind, having compassion for one of another, love as brethren. Think about what Jesus taught, Matthew 22. He teaches that we love God more than anything else, and that we love our neighbor as ourselves. See, a church that is a healthy local church is going to be a unified church because it's a loving church. Not a love that we can produce, but a love that Christ can produce through us. But see, it's not just to be limited to this room. 
we got to love one another. But you might be here today, you're like, there's somebody in this auditorium that I just cannot forgive. Start praying for them. I believe with all my heart that God can navigate, God can work through that. God can teach you to love someone that you may view as unlovable. How do we know that? Because Jesus did that for us. See, because each and every one of us, we are unlovable. What we find in the Word of God is we love Him because He first loved us. He made the decision. He chose to love us. Why? Because love is who God is. Remember what Jesus taught in John 13, verse 35? He said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples. If you have love one to another. I love what what author said. He said, there's two ways of being united. One is being frozen together, and the other is by being melted together. But then the author went on to say this, what Christians need today is to be united in brotherly, Christ-like love. And then they may have, they may expect to have the power of God upon them. You know what God can use? God can use a group of people that are united under him. But equally, what God cannot use is a local church that is right where the enemy wants them by being divided. By allowing division to take place. So this first principle of unity, there must be a Christ-like love. But here's the second thing. There must be Christ-like humility. And humility is not easy. We think about just the Son of God at the right hand of the, of the Father. What we find here in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in loveliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. As you continue to read here, verse 5, Let this mind be you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. He took upon himself the form of a servant. He was made in the likeness of man, verse 8. And being found in the fashion as a man, what did he do? He humbled himself. Church, today, are we humble the way that God wants us to be humble? Men of God, today, are we humble the way that God has called us to be humble? Women that are present today, is humility a part of who you are? Teenagers, are we practicing Christ-like humility? See, because Christ-like humility is the polar opposite of arrogant pride. There's nothing more miserable than to have to spend time with someone who is proud, they're arrogant, and they don't even know it. You know what the enemy likes to do? The enemy likes to work in the best of his ability to make us proud, arrogant people. Can I just go on a limb and say there's nothing more disgusting before God than a proud and arrogant Christian that professes the name of Jesus. He's called us to be humble. You know, what does humility look like? Can I tell you the simple example of what humility looks like? Humility looks like Jesus. Survey the Gospels. Look at how Jesus walked the streets. Look at how Jesus ministered to the multitudes. Look at how Jesus spoke to the crowds. He exemplified true Christ-like humility because he is the example. Acts 20, verse 19, we have Paul serving the Lord with all humility. Philippians, excuse me, Ephesians 4, verse 1. says, I therefore, Paul speaking, the prayers of the Lord, and beseech you to walk, that you walk worthy of the vocation where you are called, with all loneliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbear one another love, endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit of the bond of peace. Work in a unity. Takes work. How many of you are married and you believe that the unity and marital relationship takes work? You know what it takes? It takes humility. It takes trust. It takes love. Like we see these things over and over again. It's interesting. Even in the marital relationship, even for people who say they were non believers, you know what still makes a healthy marriage go? The same thing that the Word of God teaches about healthy relationships. <laughs> 
It's just amazing. It doesn't take us by surprise because we believe God's word. But all these principles that are biblical principles that work inside the church, that work outside the church, they even work in the business atmosphere. How many of you have ever worked with someone that's hard to work with? And I've worked with some new things over time. I remember my yeah, days down at Trinity, you know, Dustin and Preston will appreciate this. And we have worked with some characters. It was not always easy to get up and go to work because you knew that there was going to be frustration, there was going to be a lot of pride attached, and at times it was miserable. You know what I had to learn to do, and it's still a lesson I have to apply today. I have to die to self. I have to die to self. I have to allow Christ to make me humble each and every day. See, because within us, we have a default setting that is private. We have a default setting that is not focused on the needs of others, but rather focuses on our needs. We see this here in Philippians chapter 2. Verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Now, what a countercultural statement. We talked about it before. Culture says, you know what, take care of yourself first. And then save the leftovers for everyone else. This is what Jesus said. Esteem others better than yourself. In humility, that we find time and time again revealed to the life of Christ. Colossians 3, verse 12, down through verse 14, as we read earlier, we're to put on vows of mercy, humility, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering. We're to forbear one another. We're to forgive one another. And if any person, any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. What a sign of humility that we find in forgiveness. For new forgiveness is trusting God to allow us to get over. Forgiveness is the work of God, of course, revealed to us through the person of Jesus Christ. But through that person of Jesus Christ, we have the divine ability to forgive, to move on, to let go. Only possible through Jesus. And is humility important? Is unity important? You know, Mark 3, verse 25 teaches us. A house divided against itself, the house cannot stand. You don't believe it? Go home today, pull out your steel chainsaw, and cut your house in half. It might be okay for a little while, but the next gale force winds that we have come through the area, guess what's going to happen? The house that is cut in half will fall. Why? Because it's lost its structural integrity. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 25 says that there should be no schism, no division in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And, and notice this humility. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. If one member be honored, then all the members rejoice with it. And then 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27 says, Now you are the body of Christ and members in particular. For all the individuals, if you are an individual here today, raise your hand. Every person here, raise your hand. If I can insert into this today, if you're a person here today, you are like no other. There's no other person like you, and it's interesting. I always love this illustration. My wife has an identical twin. Her and her sister Stacy are identical. You know what's crazy? They're poor Drastically different. Now, if you look at them, they look alike. I've had people say, What's it like being married to a twin? I, like, I really don't know. I've never been married to anybody else. But it's like being married. But, like, is that awkward? Is it weird? I'm like, no. Yeah, but your wife's sister looks just like her. It's like, you understand that if I would have married Stacy, I would have been married to Stacy for all of about five minutes because <laughs> we would have killed each other. See, they look a bit different, but they're actually mirror image twins. Who's ever heard of a mirror image twin? It's interesting that if you look at them, it's like looking in the mirror. One's left handed, one's right handed. One parts their hair to the left, one parts their hair to the right. They're so similar, but at the same time, they're so different. 
See, because I'm so thankful God did not stamp out the world. We're all different. We have different talents. We have different abilities. You know what's sometimes frustrating? We find it so frustrating when people don't think the same way we think. How many of you that frustrating? That's not get like where your brain brain waves are going. You know that's divine orchestration. Because God has created us all different. But here's the beauty of the body of Christ. He brings us all together as different people. Different lives, different preferences, different talents, different abilities. He brings all of us together. You know what he calls us? His children and a family. Can I tell you guys I'm thankful for my church family? I mean that. I love you guys. I cannot imagine life without a church family. But because we're all different, because we all have different desires, likes, and dislikes, at times, guess what happens? There might be disagreements. You know, disagreements are part of life. But how we deal with disagreements are only up to how we're responding to God's Word. I'm thankful God's Word teaches us how to respond to disagreements. You know, the Word of God teaches us we're not to hold on to disagreements. We're not to allow disagreements to divide, but rather we can work through, we can forgive, we can remain humble. Principles of unity. We've got to have a Christ like love. We've got to have Christ like humility. Here's the final thing this morning when we finish. We've got to practice Christ like this. See, because it can't just work within this building. We've got to be Jesus outside these walls. If we're divided outside these walls and we come together on a Sunday morning, we cannot expect all of our problems to be worked out. See, because a life lived for Christ is 24 7. A life lived for Christ is outside these walls. At the end of the day, this is just a building. It's just what I install. See, because we are the body of Christ. Notice in verse 5, Philippians 2. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. This is all for my That's so perfect. Because what we have here in Philippians 2 5 is an invitation from the Apostle Paul to take upon yourself the mind, the heart, the example of Jesus. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Who, being in the form of God, called it not robbery to be equal with God. But he made himself of no reputation. He took upon himself the form of a servant. He was made in the likeness of men. Being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and he became a being of the death, even the death of the cross. But we find so many examples of Christ like living here in verses 5 through 8. We see in verse number 6 and verse 7 that, that he made himself of no reputation. It was not by him, it was all about glorifying the Father. He took upon himself servanthood. And what a great example from Jesus is just to be a servant. In verse 8, what did he do? He humbled himself. Such an important principle we find in the latter part of verse number 8. That he practiced obedience. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. I'm so thankful today, church. Then this work of you is not something that we just have to navigate through. This, this work of you is something that only God can orchestrate. But once again, our hearts must be pliable. Like a pastor, like I'm harboring bitterness. I've heard it said that bitterness is like drinking poison and waiting for someone else to die. When is the last time? But our prayer was much like the prayer of David in Psalm 51. God, search me. God, do your work in me. God, refine me. God, purify me. God, rid me of this arrogant pride. God, make me humble. See, because at the end of the day, a church that is doing what God has called us to do must be a church that is living like Jesus. Galatians 3.28 teaches us we are all one in Christ. It's interesting, in John 17, Jesus prayed that, that we would be one, even as he and the Father are one. 
As one author said, the relationship to Christ was the unifying factor of the early church. See, there is no name big enough, great enough, glorious enough, and powerful enough to gather together, uh, gather everyone together despite the diversity of viewpoint and all the differences of background and status in life that the name of Jesus is that name that we see in verse number 10 that is a name which is above every other name. A name in verse 11 that every tongue will one day confess that he is Lord to the glory of the Father. 1 Corinthians 1 10. Paul said, I beseech you. You remember what that word beseech means? I beg you. Brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. That there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. David Jeremiah said, Unity is an organic oneness based on Christ as the common center. Believers are not required to create unity, but to keep the unity that is already there through Jesus. We'll close with Romans 12, verse 4. We said that we have many members in one body, and all the members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one in the body of Christ. Church, if we're going to be a church that is impacting this community, it must start right here with you. We've got to be unified in what God is doing.